your neighbor and say, it's time. It's time. Come on, get, get a little bit um, comfy with that neighbor and say, it's time to make that change. It is. It's time to make that change. It's time to stop procrastinating. Come on, I'm speaking to you. It's time to stop leaving for tomorrow, to stop putting off, to stop saying, oh, it's a good idea for some day in the future, right? God and that change, that vision that he's put in your life, it's not a gym membership, okay? I know we, a lot of us, well, maybe some of you guys go to the gym, but a lot of us have gym memberships. We have the memberships, but we just don't use it right? We just feel like, I don't know about you, but just putting on gym clothes makes me feel like I worked out. So sometimes when I haven't been in the gym in a long time, I put on my gym clothes and then I walk around town looking like I just went to the gym with a high ponytail and I feel like I lost weight, but I didn't. And a lot of us are living life that way. We think just because we're putting on the Christian clothes or we're, you know, we knew, know some of the word, but you're not living it out. You're not really putting in the exercise, the time, and all of the things that God is speaking to you. He has spoken to each one of us, and he has given us a word. I know I have a word. How many of you guys have a word? I have a word. I have a promise for my life. If you don't have a promise, you don't have a vision, hey, be careful. It's time to make that change. Amen? So through Matthew 4, 17, Jesus preached this. This was Jesus' like slogan, you know? Depending on the times, there's like those little catchy slogans. But what Jesus said over and over and over and over again is repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This was his it slogan. This was what he was preaching. Yes, he healed. Yes, he, he did a lot of good things, a lot of good acts. He fed the hungry. He had compassion. He touched the leper. But his slogan, his main theme was repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And through this slogan, through this, what Jesus taught, we learned three things. Number one, if you're taking notes, change our thinking. Change our mind. Change the way of, that we think, that we see things. And this is the part of repent. Because we need his word and not our opinion. Come on. His word, not our preference. Sometimes we, tr we treat Christianity, we treat God as he was an option for lunch. So what are you feeling of having today? Well, I'm feeling having Chinese. How about you? And we treat the word of God like we can pick and choose what fits us, what, what feels good, what we're wanting. Come on, you guys, who's ready to have church this morning? Right? And then we wonder why our lives are chaotic and look more like fast food than a real actual meal. Number two, the point is going to be, and I'm going to be talking more about these things, it's time for us to get a new king. It's time for us to get a new king, and his name is Jesus Christ. In other words, we need to surrender it all to his control. He needs to be on that throne. And number three, we need to understand that God is already near. That's why he said repent. Repent does not mean that you cry and you tear your clothes. He said repent is a whole change of mind. Change the way you're thinking. Repent means you thought one way. Now repenting means now I'm going to do another way. I'm going to do it your way, Lord. So repent that what that the kingdom, the king, his kingdom, his kingdom come. The kingdom of heaven has come near. So change your mind, get a new king, and understand that God is already near. I think this week that just that alone is enough for us to chew on. Amen? So number one, and we started talking about this last week, change our mind. It's time to change your mind, to get all those flies out, to get all of that, that, that stuff that has come to contaminate contaminate our thinking. His word and not my opinion. You have the word of God. And the word of God is in one place. The word of God is in the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. There you can open up the Bible and the Bible will actually speak to you depending on what situation you are living you can read the same verse and you can learn something different because the word of God is living and it speaks to us. It corrects us. It confronts us. It comforts us. It loves us. It guides us. It is lamp unto our feet. Amen? 
And since the devil knows that you have the word of God, that you have a promise of that word of God, what is his main objective? And we learned this last week, but I want to give you a little reference. So the devil, the Bible says, comes to this world. He comes to our lives to kill to steal and to destroy. Say with me, to, to, I'm sorry, to steal, to kill and destroy. Say, steal, kill and destroy. Say it again, steal, kill and destroy. Why did I make you say it three times? Because there's things in your life that you have felt that, that have been stolen from you. There's things in your life that maybe as you reflect upon it, you feel like have been killed that are dying inside of you. There's things in our lives that have felt like they have been destroyed. It could be your family. It could be your marriage. It could be your own heart. It could be your own capacity to love someone. And do you know that I always thought in my mind that the, that the devil actually wanted to come and kill me. Like he was like, like Freddy Krueger waiting for me to get on the waterbed so he can come out with his, with, you know, his, his, whatever those things are, those claws. Yeah, thank you, Alejandra. Those claws, and then just like pull me into the waterbed and kill me. You know, I thought like the devil, and I was taught like that. Like, like I remember when I was little, and then I would go to church, and I would hear about the devil, so then I would not want to sleep with the lights off because the devil is in the dark, right? And so you needed to have the lights on, and, and I thought like he was out to get me, like he was like La Llorona or like the boogeyman or something, you know? And if you were bad... If you were bad, then he would come and get you. He would come and cuckoo. He would come and steal you, right? And so we had all of these things. How many grew up that way? Nobody? Okay, we all, okay, just all of us need to have another session of this, a therapy session, right? So I remember that it was like this fear. And so I always thought that the devil, when I read that, I was like, oh my God, he wants to kill me. Like he's after me. He's like with a mask, you know, he's Jason and he's, he's, he's coming for me. But in reality, it was until a couple of weeks ago that my husband was teaching on this verse. And he's like, you know, it's not so much that the devil wants to come and steal your shoes or your car or your purse. The devil doesn't really want your husband. Like, he doesn't need your husband, right? The devil doesn't really want your wife. Like, he's not like, oh, I want your wife. So I'm going to steal her from you. And you're like, you can have her. (laughs) Right? I always would tell my girls, I'm like, if somebody would come and steal you, they'd come and leave you on my front door like two days later when they knew how expensive you were, right? When they knew what you guys really did, they'd come and bring you back. But it's not so much that he wants your wife. It's not so much that he wants your family. It's not so much that he wants your kids. What the devil wants to do is come and steal and kill and destroy the promise, the word of God that God has given to you. Because if he's able to do this, this main objective is that then you would feel like that word is invalid. That you would feel like that word is no longer, no longer has that power in your life. Because what you see doesn't correspond with what that word is. You knew that God had given you a word. You knew you were carrying this word. But what happens when you have a word of healing But yet you find yourself like Sam flying in a helicopter to Riverside, California to get a bone marrow transplant. What happens in that moment? What happens is that the devil then comes and he sticks his little nose in and says, Did God really say? Is that actually true? Is that promise really, is is it real? When God has given you a promise for a child, but yet another pregnancy test, and it's negative. And so then you're holding on. You know that God had given you that word. You knew that when we declared this year that you were going to hold your promise, that you were going to touch your promise. Like, dude, you have the name, you have the crib, you have the room, you have the decor, but you don't have the baby. So what do you do with that? And so that's where the devil comes in because he wants you to put that down. He wants you, his main objective is for you to get that word. And you know when you know that it's so good, but then you have that collected all drawer or that collected all room, right, to where you just shut the door, you just put it in there. It's like you don't know where it goes. It doesn't really have a place. Does it really have a place in your home? So you have that drawer 
where you just throw in everything that doesn't have a place. The devil wants you to feel that the word of God, that the promise that he has given you doesn't have a place in your life so that you would take that word and you would put it in that drawer or that you would pack it up and stick it in the attic. You know what goes in the attic. You forget about it. I had bought so many decorations for, for a, like, holidays and stuff, and then I, 4th of July, and then I, ha, I have so many U.S. flags. You'd think I was running for a Congress or something. Be, why? Because every single time, every year I'd be like, babe, I need the flags for 4th of July. What do you say, honey? You're like, I'll take them out of the attic. But then it, I have, then I go to Target, and they're there, and they're $1.99. So I'm like, why am I going to make my husband go all the way in the attic for flags that I can spend $15 on and buy a whole new set, right? So then you go collect, because what goes in the attic, you just forget about it. And that's what the, de- the devil wants you to put the word and the promise inside of that attic. He wants you to go rent out a storage space, pack it up, and put it over there so it's not close to you. And, and worse yet, he wants you to doubt that word, that you would actually crumble it up and throw it away in the garbage. Because his main intent is that you would question God. That you would question God. If you're taking notes, that would be it for today. His main, his, his, his main goal is that you would question God. His main goal is for you to question God. God, I'm going to say it a third time. The devil's main goal as you live your life, as you see your life, as you see your children, as you struggle, as you try to build, as you do, is that you would question God. Because a question reveals that there is uncertainty and confusion. Because a question is only asked when there is doubt. When you're not sure. When you're feeling that things are unclear. That's when you question God, when you don't know the answer. Genesis records that our personal, all-knowing, all-powerful God created everything that existed. Amen? God created everything that existed. Look at your neighbor. Okay? Even though they look a little bit like a monkey, they didn't come from the monkey. Just kidding. Just kidding. They don't. They're cute monkey, right? No. Come on, you guys. We didn't come from monkeys. You know, we didn't just boom into existence. Well, we did with the, with the word. With the word. Say, you were created with the word. You were, you were created with the word. Because our Lord, our creator, spoke everything into existence. So in, in truth, there was a big bang type of thing. It was his word. And his word said, let there be light. And what does the word of God says? And there was. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke it into existence in Genesis 1 from the beginning. See, Genesis is Genesis 1. Genesis is not actually the book or the chapter 1 of creation. It is the book about our creator. It is about his characteristics. People look at Genesis 1 thinking that it's telling them about creation, but really it's God revealing himself as God and his capability. God said, let there be light. And there was. Wow. What's uncertain about that? (laughs) There's no uncertainty there. Things are totally clear. He said, let there be a vault between water and water, and he called this vault sky. God said, God said, all of Genesis 1 is God saying, God declaring, God seeing, and God saying that it is good. And his words created everything. But with his very breath, with his very breath, he breathes life into man and declares words of blessing over him. With his very breath. Everything else he created just with a spoken word. But with his hands, he took dirt, something that people would think is of no value. He molded man into whose image? Into our image, it says in the Bible. 
Our image means that there's more than one, and it is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can we say amen? From the beginning is the evidence of the Trinity of God. From the beginning is the evidence of the Creator's capacity to speak things that are not as if they were, to speak things into existence. What are you speaking into your home? What are you speaking into your husband, into your wife, into your kids? What are the words? Are they life? Are they blessing? So then Genesis 2, it's again an explanation about this creation. And then there's a word of warning from God. Because God made everything so wonderful. And he says, from all the trees you can eat, but just from this one in the middle, from this one, say with me, this one. You can have all of this, but from this one, this one, this is the parameter. This is the only thing I don't want you to touch. This one thing. And he says, you shall not eat. Because if you eat from this tree, from the tree of good and evil, you shall surely die. Chapter 1, he spoke everything into creation. Chapter 2, he gives a word of warning. He says, only this one. Say with me, this one. There's things that God has said, just this one thing I ask of you. And yet that one thing, that one thing is what screams louder to you than all of it. Chapter 3, verse 1. Wow, I can't even believe it. We're in chapter 3, like, like, so up to this point, there was no questions. There was, it was the word of God creating everything. It was what it was. He said it. He declared it. He said, don't eat from this. There is no questions recorded until chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1, here we go, is the first question ever recorded in the Bible. Only three chapters in. And it's no coincidence that the question was asked by the devil. Because he's the one that comes to plant the seed of doubt. And he says to Eve as she is alone. As she is alone. And it's not just she as he is alone. When you are alone, that is where the devil comes to ask these questions. When you are apart from people, where you are feeling lonely and depressed and not connected, it is the devil's job to get you at that moment and ask the questions at your most vulnerable. When you don't have someone else to say, hey, snap out of it, you're, no, do not even listen to that. No, there's no question. God did say. God did say that you would have a child. God did say that you would be healed. God did say that he has good things for you. God did say that you would have a healthy marriage. God did say that your kids would honor you. God did say that you would live to see your grandchildren. God did say. But you know what? The devil wants to get you on your own. And it's when you're there on your own that he comes up to eat. Even he's asked this, did God really say? Did God really say you must not eat from the garden? Isn't it that God just knows that you're just going to be just like him? Isn't it just like that God doesn't know that it's the best for you? Does God really want the best for you? Is living according to his plan actually the best way to live? I mean, did God really say behind the simple question was a plant to plant a seed of doubt into Eve's heart about the word that God has spoken to her and to her husband. To distract her away from the truth. And a lot of people go back and say, well, it's because the man. It's because the man didn't give her all of the right directions, right? Because he wasn't, she wasn't there when God told him. We could go into that, but then later on she responds to him and says, yes, God did say that we should not eat. Because then we would surely die. So she responds. She had to answer. So someone had to tell her. And there's only one other person there. And it was her husband. Okay? So, I mean, obviously she knew because she responded back to him. She started to have a conversation with the devil. If you find yourself having a conversation with the devil, let me tell you you're in trouble. You shouldn't be having a conversation with the devil. You should be giving orders. Devil, get out of my home in the name of Jesus. I am not listening to you. I am not listening to you. So if you're having a conversation, if you find yourself, just be like, okay, I need help here. Like, pray for me. Something's going on, okay? So then he wants to distract her from that blessing. So she responds to him and says, yes, he did say, but then he said, but will you surely die? 
Or is it more, there goes the gray area. There's the doubt. There's the, well, do we really have to? Can I do it halfway? I mean, you know, if I still do a little bit. And that's where the devil starts planting those seeds. Is it a big deal that I don't actually tithe? I mean, come on. I mean, is it a big deal that I'm sleeping with my girlfriend? You know, God knows. Did God really say you shouldn't? You guys, and I could go on and on. Those are just like the most apparent. But it's like, you know, did God really? Open your Bible and read. Open his word and find out. So this devil fed doubt into her and Eve just ate it up. It's time to make a change. It's time to make a change. It's time to say, no, devil, I'm not having this conversation with you. I have decided that my house and I are going to serve the Lord, and that is what it's going to be. That is a decision that is made through, you know, through any, any trouble. I, under, I, I get it. It doesn't look good, but I have already decided this is the way that we are doing it. It's time to let God change our mind. Can someone say amen? His word, not my opinion. His word, not my opinion. Number two, and with this, I'm going to close this message, but it, give me a couple minutes so I can explain it. Um, number two, we need to get a new king. We need to understand that to s- completely surrender all to his control. He said, repent, change your mind. The kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of who? Of heaven is near. So when I was growing up, I was very self-sufficient. From the time I was little, my mom said I would disappear because I would be in the bathtub. I thought I was a mermaid, or I wanted to. I had seen Splash, so I thought if I would put salt in the water. I don't know if you've seen that movie giving out my age. But it's a movie. It's called Splash. And it's this girl, and she goes in water. And if water hits her, she turns into a mermaid. So I saw this movie, and you have to put salt in the water. So I would put salt in the water, and I would go in the bathtub from the time I was tiny. And my mom would say I would disappear, and I would already be napping somewhere under a bed. or I was very self-sufficient to a fault, even. I was left places because, and I'm, I mean, I'm not saying like I was this perfect little child, but I was very disciplined from the time I was little. And I would just do my things. I would feed. I would comb my hair, do everything I could do. I would organize my clothes on for a week, yes, from the time I was little. You guys can verify it with my mom. I was like one of those little children that my mom would say, what is wrong with this child? Like, what is wrong with her? Like, there is just something wrong with her, Right. And I say I was self-sufficient to a fault because something happened. I was so used to making my own decisions. I was so used to being able to say where I was going to go when I was like, like Julia Roberts. You know, I say when, I say with who, I say how. Like, I was just like having that moment, you know, in my life. Like, I just called all of the shots. And my parents allowed it. They allowed it because I was so organized. Then I get married to a Mexican, Latino man. Okay, I get married, and now I'm supposed to submit. Oh, my gosh. I don't longer say who, what, (laughs) when. It's like, I'm like, babe, so do you think, you know, and I wait for the moment. Do you think this is a good idea? I, I was having a lot of trouble with it. And I try to make fun, but so much that I think the first couple of months of marriage, I mean, it was bad. It was bad because there isn't something that Mario could tell me that I didn't take offense with. Because he would say, we're going to do this. And I'm like, why? Like, I, when did you consult with me? You know, I don't want to go and do that. I don't want to eat with those people. Like, I would literally be like, 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 or I have this plan. I have to study. I already made, like, look at my, my time thing. I don't have time for this. Like, I already made my plans, and I have to study. I was going to school. I have to do this. I have to go exercise. Like, like there was no room for anything of his influence over my life. Like, basically, I thought I was going to be married, and then, I don't know, I was just going to rule the world, you know, and rule him too. I quickly found out after packing my bags three times. I packed my bags three times, and I say the story three times. The third time he looked at me, now the two other times he said sorry, and he was like, no, you know, we could work it out, but whatever, he'd pray for me, he'd always pray for me, because whatever, he he was always a pastor, (laughs) so he would pray, and I'm like, I don't want you to pray for me, right? 
I'm serious. You laugh, but I'd be like that. I was the one, like, he wanted to pray, and I'm like, I don't want to pray. Like, stop praying for me. And the third time, he looked at me. He goes, Myra, if you pack your bags again and you go, you're not going to come back. This is it. From that first year, I think it was like the first six months, the third bag, pack bagging, I never packed my bags again. Why? Because he put his foot down. It wasn't until he put his foot down and I saw clearly, I saw clearly who should actually be the head of my household. I saw clearly that I had a man and I had someone that wanted to look over after me, over me, that wanted to provide. You know that many of us have this type of relationship with God. We want to say who, we want to say when, we want to say what. And we want, instead of us following God, we want God to follow us. We make all of our plans without any space for him. And then we're like, we don't have time for you, Lord. Like, I don't have time for this. Like, I'm really busy. Like, what's this fast thing? Like, I don't have time for that. I don't have the budget for it. I don't have whatever. And then you make excuses. Then you make excuses to yourself. And all along, what God wants to do is just to love you, to protect you, to provide for you, to be the king that you need, to take pressure off of your shoulders. And Mario would look at me and he would say, Myra, he's like, I'm not going to leave you. I know you had to be self-sufficient. I know that you had to fight. I know that you had to apply, that you had, that you, everything that you've gotten, you, you fought for. He said, but can you understand that now I want to fight for you? Can you understand that I want to go in front of the battle for you? That I want to be here. And it was hard for me to understand that type of love. It was hard for me to understand that type of love because I was not used to that type of love. I was used to the type of love that I had to earn, that I had to merit, that I had to call the shots, that if something went wrong, I had to resolve for myself. And having this type of love just changed my life, like having the type of love of God. And in reality, when I hear the Lord's Prayer and Jesus looking at his disciples says this. They say, Jesus, how should we pray to God? Jesus, how should we pray? Because all of this time we've been taught through the Old Testament that we had to do, that we had to merit, that we had to circumcise, that we had to, um, you know, observe, that we had to keep the Sabbath this way, that we had all of this to earn God's love. So now they have Jesus with them sitting there and they look at him and they're like, Jesus, teach us. They're like, teach us because all along we've been taught that it's through our, through our power, through our struggles, through our, you know, fighting for stuff. And then this is where the Lord's prayer comes. And Jesus looks at them and he said, when you talk to your father, to, I mean, when you talk to God, this is how you should pray. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Again, I'm saying it because we're raising God up. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, not, not, not my kingdom, not my will, not my desires, not, not what I think, but thy kingdom. You know the prodigal son comes in and I always thought that the prodigal son this was the son that came and asked his dad for his inheritance and he I always thought it was the money I always thought the prodigal son the issue was the money he wanted his dad's money and he wanted his inheritance beforehand but again my husband was teaching and it just rocked my mind it just changed my whole outlook it's like actually the prodigal son lived in the best house the prodigal son drove the best car that he did not have to pay for or the best camel that he did not have to pay for, that he did not have to feed. He dressed in the best clothes. He ate the food of, of, of the house. He, he drank the choice wine. Why? Because his father was wealthy. Wealthy enough to give him his inheritance when he came to ask for it. So I always thought it was the money, but then wait a minute. He had everything. So if it wasn't the money, then what was it? It was the control. He wanted the control over the money. He wanted to say when. He wanted to say how. He wanted to say with what. And that's where he lost everything. It's the control. It's where you say, 
I don't need to be dependent on you. And it might sound like you just grew up there. I'm so independent. But you can become independent with, to a fault. You can become independent to a point where it actually comes to bite you in the butt. Where you have to say, Lord, I want to be independent of sin, but I want to be dependent on you. I want to be independent as a person where I can provide for myself, but yet I want to be dependent enough to still look up to you and say, my Father who art in heaven, it's your name, it's your kingdom, it's your will, Lord. It's like I want to be able to go out and be a go-getter and be a business owner, but at the end of the day, I still know that I am just an administrator of everything that you have given me, Lord. I want to get to a point, God, where I build a home and a family and when I look around and I don't say oh well look at me but I say wow look what the Lord has done the Lord is a good father can you say amen and like our brother Kanye would say Jesus is king amen. come on come on Jesus is king he got at least that right right other stuff he got right too but Jesus is king that needs to be something that we tattoo in our heart Jesus is king he is king it's not me it's not what I think it's okay I'm feeling this but then let me put it down at Jesus's feet let me see what he wants to say I'm struggling with this God but you know what I, I need to know what you think because you're king you're sitting on 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 that on that throne but for him to sit on the throne you got to get off you got to decide that you're not gonna have God follow you, but you're gonna follow God. We can't go back and change the beginning. How many know that? We can't, we can't go back and change the beginning. I wish we could. I wish there's things in my life that I could erase, moments in my life that I could, I, you know, I could just not have done, or words in my life that I have said that I could take back. But we can't go back to the beginning. We can't change the beginning. But we can start where we are and change the ending. We can today. Today, today's that day, today's that time where you can actually change the ending. And that's when you open up your heart and you ask Jesus to be king of your life. Where you ask him, where you recognize that yes, there is a God. Yes, there is one God. And that God, our Father, to his right hand has his son Jesus. Doesn't have, you know, your good, your good uncle that was so nice. No, Santa Claus is not to the right. The Virgin Mary is not to the right. No, sorry. Doesn't say that in the Bible. It says the only thing is that Jesus is to the right. And the whole, the complete job is Jesus is to look at the Father and to be our like lawyer, to be like, look, Dad, I got their back. I'm covering, I'll pay for it. So I heard a story. It was about these two friends. It was on a devotional, two friends. And one of them, as they grew up, one of them became really, really bad and, you know, was a thief or was just doing really bad stuff, got into shady business. And the other one became a judge. Two different paths, but these were childhood friends. Friends that, you know, spent summers together, that told stories, that stayed up late, that got in trouble even together. And one day the judge is sitting on his, on, you know, his whatever, courtroom. And he looks out and recognizes his friend. And his friend is being judged for have done so many things. Now his job, he wouldn't be a good judge if he was lenient. Because the other side needs justice. He's there to implement justice. So then looking out, he's like, I'm caught between, you know, I'm caught between this. Like my, my heart is torn. I need to be a judge, but yet I love him. Like I know him. I know that he can be better. I know that right now he's in trouble. I know he's being accused. I know he did it even. I know he did it. There's evidence against him. There's no doubt that he did it. But I know, I believe he can change. But he can't say that as the judge because there's the other side that is seeking justice. So then he says, because you did this, because you stole this, because you did all this, you're, you're sentenced to pay the maximum fine. And this is the fine. And boom, he gives it. He gives the verdict. Then he comes down from his judge's table and he go, tells his friend, I don't think you remember me, but I'm so-and-so. And I know I just gave you the maximum verdict, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to pay it for you. I had to give you the maximum verdict because that's what you deserved. But because I love you, I'm willing to pay. That's what Jesus did. 
That's what Jesus did. He paid. And he didn't pay money. He paid with his life. And today you can open up your heart and you could recognize that no other person, no other person, no other man, no other saint, no other anyone did what Jesus did. Pay with his own life for your sin and mine. So I want you to open up your heart. Everybody close their eyes. Everyone, everyone.